When it comes to qualifying whether or not uh, the person that's going to be doing the reunification therapy has the ability and training to do this, you should understand that this is a subset of forensic psychology. There are going to be a lot of therapists who may want to do this work and may even be very suited to this work, but as soon as they hear that the courts are involved, they run because dealing with the courts can be a very arduous process. And also, therapists who deal with forensic matters are more likely to be dealing with malpractice, insurance claims, and allegations to the state boards of doing something wrong. So there are a lot of people who don't want to do this work. But it's also important to understand that there are forensic psychologists that aren't trained to do this work either. It's certainly true that those that have done best interest evaluations and child custody evaluations know the issues that are going to play out. So that's a good start. But you also need to have someone who has the personality to deal with chaos because there's going to be a lot of animosity, uh, animosity going back and forth. They have to be willing to write the courts and they have to have comfort in, in navigating uh, a, a judicial process that can be uh, difficult at times. So, it's also important to consider that the client should speak now or forever hold their peace, meaning um, very often when people are seeking reunification therapists, both sides will be offered the opportunity to, to give three suggestions and you know one party will strike out the other three suggestions and vice versa. It's important to get that right ahead of time because once that reunification therapist is ordered by the court, that's the person who's going to do it. So you're going to need a forensic psychologist someone who has a lot of experience in navigating the courts, someone who understands the developmental needs of children, and someone who has the personality to both sit inside chaos, hear both sides, and work as an agent of the court. It's similarly crucial that people consider in the orders for reunification when they're being drafted for the judge's signature to include ahead of time what the sanctions will be when people don't comply. The better you have that laid out, the more your client can understand what the expectations are and what will be at the reunification therapist's um, uh, utilization in conjunction with the court, of, of course, if they don't comply. The better you lay that out, the easier the process is going to be. Otherwise, you're just going to have the similar battle that took place outside of the courtroom now spill over into the reunification therapist's office without any um, power and authority of the court. That will have to be determined later. That could um, include sanctions, financial sanctions that the court might pose on someone who is not um, complying with the court order and the recommendations of reunification therapy. And there's also been times that judges have written orders and signed off on orders that said that if you do not comply with these orders, the custody uh, arrangement will be completely reviewed and reassigned. Okay. Because we're dealing with children, um, it's, in, it's crucial that we consider what the developmental age is of the children, not just their chronological age. Why do I say that? Well, I spoke earlier about the importance of considering what their opinion is of what they want, but the other thing that we should also consider is what are their needs. The younger a child, before they're in school, they're going to have very different needs than an adolescent. There have been many cases where people have complained of estrangement and alienation, and the fact of the matter is, is that the child reached adolescence, had more interest in being with their social group, and didn't want to be with either parent. And parents have to understand that that's a normal part of development. If you are not understanding that, the reunification therapist has a responsibility to talk to you about that. There are times that kids don't want to be around their parents, not because they don't love their parents, not because their parents are bad, but simply they'd rather prefer, they'd rather be with their friends and have fun. And that's developmentally normal and okay. Okay. It should be considered that there are times, unfortunately, that the children are not valued as children. This is not something that fathers do and mothers don't, or mothers do and fathers don't. But when people consider parenting time, sometimes they translate it into a dollar amount. For almost all jurisdictions, how much money is ordered in child support is based on two different things. The comparable income of the two parties and the percentage of overnights of where the children are. 
So there are times that people will fight tooth and nail, and you'd like to believe that it has everything to do with what they believe is in their children's best interest, and it has much more to do with the financial uh, ramifications that will occur if the custody agreement changes. It's not a matter of right or wrong, it's a matter of understanding what is. This segues nicely into giving advice to your clients that when they're going through a divorce and they're dealing with these matters, they have to put their swords down. There's going to be a lot of pain, a lot of argument, a lot of torment that's gone into the process before they ever get to my office or any reunification therapist's office. And what I will often say is that I'm good, but I'm not so good that I can change what's happened. We cannot get past the fact that one person has hurt another person. That's impossible, and it's not my job. My job, and the reunification therapist's job, is to get the parents to put their swords down and focus on what their children need. And what their children need is good, supportive parenting from both parties. They have to learn how to work together to give the parents what they need, because healthy children will split the parents. It, the, the typical situation is the child who says, hey mom, can I go to the mall? Dad said it's okay if it's okay with you. And then they'll say the same exact thing to the father. If the parents don't have the ability to communicate with one another, if for no other reason than to determine what's appropriate for parental decisions, then the children are going to wind up running the show, and that's not good for them. So in sum, Reunification therapy is a very complicated process that tends to be at the end of a long legal battle. The goal of which is to help parents that have been estranged from their children reconnect with their children and develop a, a path that they can start to walk together to move towards healing. It will not undo the pain, but very often the children have already experienced so much pain in the process that they're looking from, for some stability and some reassurance and some optimism. It's not uncommon at all for children, especially early on in the process, to wish that their parents got back together. But when there's high conflict, it doesn't take long before they start to realize that they have the best chance when both of their parents are happy. Happy parents tend to be more effective parents, and sometimes people are happier if they're not together. So children can adapt, but not without their parents' help. Reunification therapy, tries to help that process along.